Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Andrew Wilson, Executive Director of the Center for International Private Enterprise, also known as SIPE. You know, it's been a big year for the global anti-corruption community, a year with new risks and challenges, especially with the pandemic. But it has also been a year of optimism. This month, the United Nations completed its first ever session against corruption, and President Biden issued his memorandum on establishing the fight against corruption as a core United States national security interest. And just last week, Ambassador Samantha Power, head of USAID, was in Central America and announcing plans for an anti-corruption rapid response program. I had the pleasure of meeting with Ambassador Administrator Power yesterday, and she reiterated the importance USAID is placing on coordinating a whole of government effort on the matter. In 2016, SIP designed a rapid response program to respond to our partners' need for swift anti-corruption support. This initiative was funded by, first by the National Endowment for Democracy and later by the State Department. We hit the ground with our first rapid response program in 2017 in the Gambia, which led to the establishment of the country's first anti-corruption NGO. And since then, we've been running similar programs in Armenia, Ecuador, and Sudan. In addition to our field work, SIPE also convenes every quarter a consortium of practitioners, donors, and local activists here in Washington for a blunt evaluation of what's working and what isn't. At these meetings, recent topics have included a look at donor coordination and how to effectively time interventions, and in the spirit of collaboration, Democratic Institute, Transparency International, the International Republicans Institute, and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Going forward this summer, we're launching a new website to better serve the rapid response community writ large, as well as a podcast series from rapid response practitioners globally. You know, it's no accident the subject of today's event, the Crook Act, has a rapid response component that is funded through the legislation's anti-corruption action fund. That's because some of the same core experts and practitioners who helped SIPE devise its innovative rapid response program in 2016 have been strong advocates for the action fund dimension of the Crook Act. But before we hear from one of the Crook Act's lead sponsors, Senator Ben Cardin, we brought together a panel that represents perspectives from the private sector, civil society, and government. And with that, I'll turn this over to Frank Brown, and I'll rejoin you in about 25 minutes to introduce the Senator. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, for the introduction and, and all your support since 2016, as we incubated and launched an anti-corruption rapid response program here at SIPE. And good afternoon, everybody. We look forward to seeing you all in person soon. But in the meantime, it's great to see so many familiar names at today's event especially the anti-corruption practitioners and experts from around the world. Before introducing our three panelists, I would like to say a few words about the connection between the Crook Act's creation of an anti-corruption action fund and the rapid response work that we have been doing here at SIPE. First, to give you a sense of the scope of the Crook Act's action fund, it is worth noting that the size of the fund depends on the number of US Foreign Corrupt Practice Act actions that exceed $50 million. Under the Crook Act, each company that has FCPA fines and penalties that exceed $50 million must pay an additional $5 billion into the action fund. Based on our estimates at SIPE, that will result in the action fund receiving between $15 and $30 million a year. Where will that action fund money, where will that action fund money go? It will support US government efforts to respond to windows of opportunity for anti-corruption reform. And so what does SIPE have to do with all this? Well, beginning in 2016, we began working with anti-corruption practitioners to come up with a way to meet the demand of our civil society partners around the world who are asking for assistance and very quickly supporting new and democratic governments that had made anti-corruption commitments. One of those practitioners is here today. That's Abigail Bellows a scholar with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. At SIPE, our first project launched in the Gambia in 2017, when a democratically elected president replaced a thoroughly corrupt dictator who had been in power for 22 years. Projects after the Gambia 
included Armenia in 2018, and then in 2019 in Ecuador and Sudan. In all these cases, we are supporting civil society partners to build on and maintain the momentum that's created by uprisings that are fueled in part over deep frustrations around corruption. Aside from the work in the field, back here in DC, as Andrew mentioned, we have been gathering a rapid response community of practice. It is a closed door group. It meets quarterly and the members include people on the ground from all over the world, from Indonesia to Armenia to Africa, donors from countries, again, throughout the world, academics and experts. Their aim is to come up with evidence-based actionable recommendations for future rapid response interventions. To give you a sense of the, of the community of practices deliberations, recent sessions have focused on what will happen in Afghanistan after September 11th when the US troops withdraw and the, the challenge that the anti-corruption NGOs will face on the ground. Another recent session was devoted to donor coordination when a window of opportunity opens up in a given country to what extent do international donors coordinate or not coordinate and what kind of challenges that does the dysfunctionality that a lot of people have run into represent. So in the spirit of that community of practice and our commitment to sharing in an honest, neutral way, the findings, we've gathered three eminent people to take part in the panel preceding Senator Cardin's appearance. Delia Ferreira Rubio is the chair of Transparency International. She's based in Buenos Aires. Charles Rick Johnston is a managing director with Citi and the newly elected chair of business at OECD. And he's joining us from Washington, DC. And Abigail Bellows, as mentioned before, with the Carnegie Endowment is joining us from New Jersey. And we're gonna kick off the questions with one to Abigail. I'd like to note as we launch into this segment that the, the amount of time we have is fairly short. So please forgive me panelists if I cut you off and, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, each of your answers to the three questions. We're gonna adopt a sort of lightning format. And with that in mind, I'll, I'll throw the first one to Abigail to you. The question is why is the element of speed important when we're reducing corruption in emerging markets? Windows of opportunity on anti-corruption can make a big difference and speed is required to seize those opportunities. We see from the data that BDEM has put together that in 2019, the last year data was collected before the pandemic, the number of anti-corruption protests was hugely on the rise. In fact, 44% of countries around the world had major pro-democratic mass protests in that year. And a substantial number of those protests produced political transitions with new reformers coming in, promising to clean house. But often we're seeing that the results of these transitions prove disappointing. Even when the reformers are sincere, entrenched interests mobilize and the public gets distracted and it's very hard for them to make good on these commitments. So during that brief window of opportunity, that's when the US and others can surge support and bolster local political will while it exists during that moment of elasticity. But in spite of the opportunity, the budget right now for US anti-corruption assistance tends to be small. It's only about $115 million annually. Static, the assistance is planned years in advance sometimes. And it's geographically rigid. Most is pre-allocated to individual countries. So there's not a lot of flexibility for being able to be responsive when these windows of opportunity emerge. That's why the Crook Act is so promising because the Anti-Corruption Action Fund contemplated in the act would be able to really overcome that kind of constraint and empower diplomats and frontline development practitioners to be able to spot those windows and surge support. We tried to get this action fund off the ground when I was at the State Department in 2014, 2015, 2016, but weren't able to do so. So it's really encouraging to see Congress taking this forward. Thanks, Abigail. So that, that's a, a really concise sort of overview about why this is important. And one thing, as I throw the question to Rick, I wanted to note is that at SIPE, the Center of International Private Enterprise, as the name implies, we are especially interested in the role that the private sector can play in overcoming corruption. And one thing that we've noticed is that 
in, in the cycle of reforms, when businesses feel comfortable in entering a newly democratic market, foreign businesses that is, um, that can be a powerful incentive um, and powerful sort of force in favor of the new government as the citizenry sees foreign businesses coming in, investment dollars coming in. And with that in mind, Rick, you better than anybody on this panel have a, the, a business vantage point on all this in a, in a truly global sense with your position at City. Sorry, you think with all the all the time we've spent on these things. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't want to be I, I don't want to sound negative because I think what the crook acts about what the rapid action uh, efforts by site uh, seek to accomplish those are incredibly important. But for for business, we tend to look at a a longer term. Now. The fact that there is a rapid response to an opportunity, as Abigail pointed out, um, business is certainly aware of um, the importance of momentum. And when you have those kinds of large scale protests that clearly, and, and clearly when, they, when the candidates, for example, are running on a major plank, and it's amazing how many candidates run on anti-corruption as a main theme of their, of their uh, campaigns, when you see that, you do have to strike while the iron's hot. Will business follow immediately when they see something like that? Probably not. I mean, to be honest about it, uh, they're going to wait to see how it plays out. But without that, without that, effort, without that support, let's say for media uh, to continue to beat that drum, to to try to stop the possible, uh, we'll call it infection of corruption that unfortunately takes place in so many instances as Ab Abigail referred to it, and it is so true. It, you know, you, you come into office with the greatest intentions, then you see how the system works, and I'll put that in quotes, and um, things start to go south from there. But I think that it is, uh, it's very, very important when there's a window of opportunity, again, as Abigail said it, uh, that not only the private sector, but the government, and this Crook Act thing is, is, a, is a really great idea. We can talk maybe a little further about how it might be deployed. I, for example, would like to see more private sector involvement in how Crook Act funds are deployed. It's all interagency, and I think that's a shortcoming. Thanks, Rick. So turning to Delia, I wanted to mention that um, one of the projects, one of the most interesting projects that Transparency International currently has underway focuses on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in bringing about these windows of opportunity that we're talking about. So in other words, when governments show themselves to not be up to the task of responding to the dire needs of the populace in dealing with this public health disaster, um, they often are quite vulnerable, especially when corruption is involved. And that the Transparency International program is a wonderful, it's a wonderful sort of evidence of TI's global reach and the way they're able to cook up programs in Berlin and very quickly scan the globe and all their TI chapters and see where they can get some real impact and traction. So with that in mind, Julie, I'd like to, to throw the question to you and ask why is the element of speed important when reducing corruption in these emerging markets? It is uh, central in our strategy to be flexible enough to react when the uh, window of opportunity, as Abigail has said, appears. And this has to do with corruption scandals in some countries, with situations like COVID vaccines, for instance, or uh, when you have a change in government. In those moments, you have uh, the possibility or you see uh, the creation of a social energy that can support uh, reforms. And you need to capitalize that energy. You need to offer results. And this means that you have to show the results in the short term, even minor results. You have to, to prove that you are changing things. And that's uh, essential because people are getting fed up with commitments and just declaration or, or speeches. So if you don't use this 
the, the space, the window of opportunity. The result is that you lose the social energy and you increase the lack of trust in institutions and in, uh, in the leadership in general. So uh, you are ending, uh, creating a problem bigger than you have before. So Delia, that's, that's a fascinating point. And I, I'm gonna stick with you in the next question because you, 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 you mentioned some the social energy um, and the need for swift action to reinforce the public sense of hope in the new government. And so my next question has to do with what sort of challenges you foresee in the implementation of the action fund included in the Crook Act. And I link it to your previous answer because large governments like the US aren't always known for acting quickly. And when they when they act slowly and when they sort of try to implement or impose upon countries um, a solution that's been cooked up a few years before, as Abigail mentioned, can sometimes happen, um, that can sometimes do more harm than good. And Afghanistan perhaps is an example of that. So with that in mind, what, what kind of challenges do you see with, with the implementation of the Action Fund? I would mention four uh, challenges. One, the excess of bureaucracy in the delivery of these funds and the application of the funds. Second, lack of transparency and lack of accountability on the ground, in the field, on, on the use of these funds. Uh, and the fourth one would be the risk that the funds end up in, uh, in, uh, in the process and not in really getting impact in the field and that would lead against to disappointment that from the point of view of the social scenario is another challenge super thanks delia and rick i'd, I'd like to, to give you the next the same question uh what, what sort of challenges do you see in the implementation of the action fund I think Delia's point is the uh, is the really the key factor, and that is bureaucracy. Obviously, we're talking about something with speed and uh, reacting to an opportunity. You you don't have a lot of time to plan if you don't already have uh, what you have in mind, what your plan is already well scoped out. Um, by the time the money hits the market, so to speak and um, uh, is infused into whether it's NGOs or whatever, uh, there can be a huge lag time there. And you probably, you know, the window will have closed. So I'd say that's the, 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 the potential for bureaucracy, but also the, the potential for um, coming in too late with a good plan. And that's where you really need mm -hmm. on the ground resources to keep you very apprised of the situation as, as certainly Delia and a Abigail and you, Frank, you well know, on the ground circumstances regarding corruption change overnight. So you, you really, the, the good thing about the action plan is it's contemplating speed to take advantage of a situation. But if that speed is not really attuned to the real situation on the ground, as it presents itself, uh, then it's going to be almost a waste of money. It'll be a waste of resources. And then, as, as Delia sort of points out, the people who are waiting for change and they see all this effort and nothing changes become even more frustrated or, in fact, just lose lose hope, which is the last thing you want. So that, that's a perfect setup for, for Abigail, who has served you know, inside the government and has had a front row seat of how bureaucracies can move quickly or, or not so quickly. And I think perhaps as she contributed to the drafting of the Crook Act, um, had some of the things that she observed when she was in government in mind. So Abigail, what, what do you think? What do you, what do you see coming down the pike in terms of implementation? I share my uh, colleagues on the panel's concern with the question of bureaucracy and how to retain agility um, in a program that is designed to have speed. But I also think it's worth considering the risks of being too quick um, or too um, uh, not inclusive enough across different aspects of the government. So interagency coordination will be something that those implementing this act will have to think carefully about because the US State Department will have a role in terms of linking the assistance to the diplomacy 
uh, USAID, of course, in terms of their programmatic expertise and drawing on lessons from the Office of Transition Initiatives uh, at AID. Um, the Department of Justice will want to have a voice given the links to the FCPA proceeds. Uh, I could imagine it would be valuable to have the intelligence community contribute their assessment of different political transitions and how real they are. So that kind of um, different uh, set of actors, they'll need to really understand what a shared governance model could look like for this action fund that brings together those different perspectives, but still has that element of speed. Um, and isn't um, suggesting sort of pre-cooked solutions where everything's kind of hit play when there's a transition. Like that's certainly not gonna work in terms of being responsive to the realities on the ground that emerge. Um, so I think that's gonna be one important consideration. Um, and the second that I'll highlight in terms of challenges is really how the implementing mechanism is structured that uh, through which these funds are deployed. Um, we could imagine a range of models possible from a consortium of pre-selected grantees, which is the model used by the Fundamental Freedom Fund that uh, the US already has. We could imagine a quarterly grant competition across different embassies where there's a central pot of money and embassies themselves are initiating uh, when they spot windows of opportunity in the field, um, which is the model that the Fiscal Transparency Innovation Fund uses. Um, or it could be something that ambassadors tap into on a much more decentralized basis, um, like USAID's Disaster Assistance Authority that ambassadors can use when there's um, major flooding in their country or something. Um, so you could see many different levels of centralization or decentralization possible in how this is implemented. Um, and I think that there's pros and cons to the different models, but uh, my, my vote would be to try to find some way to sustain the link between assistance and diplomacy. I think it would be a real loss if this fund was just um, handed off to an implementing partner outside of government to run with. That might be efficient and, and quick, and, and that partner might be able to overcome some of the bureaucratic hurdles that we just discussed. But I think the downside is that it would take away one of the biggest benefits of having the US government involved in this, these issues, which is the possibility of some sort of conditionality between government assistance on the one hand and uh, and the responsiveness and actions of the partner government on the other hand. So the US in engaging with Ukraine on the creation of the special um, anti-corruption court was able to use conditionality quite effectively. And I've heard from partners um, at ANTAC and other Ukrainian organizations that that conditionality was hugely helpful in amplifying their voices from the bottom up and pushing for these sort of changes. So. I think uh, that's just one example of how assistance can be linked to diplomacy, but I think some way of doing that will be quite important in leveraging the potential for this action fund to have an outsized impact. Those are, those are super points, Abigail, and they very much, um, they're very much backed up by our observations in the field, especially around the amount of information that, that, the, that lies within the embassies and the, the sort of detailed knowledge they have typically of the opposition figures who, who come to power, um, as well as the conditionality piece, because that's at those moments of transition, that's a, max, a, a point of maximum influence. And to see those squandered is really a shame. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, we've got about seven more minutes left. I'm gonna uh, move on to our third question. I've, I've got a, been taking notes, I have a bunch of follow-up questions if, if we're so fortunate as to have more time if the Senator joins late, but let me turn to the third one. And that's really the bottom line. Um, is, this, is this action fund likely to be a, an effective new way of fighting corruption? Rick, what do you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. And, and I think as Abigail pointed out, just the mere fact that the government could be, let's assume this act passes, uh, you know, it goes through and it does look like it will. It looks like it's got bipartisan support if my research is telling me correctly. But I, I think that for the for the U.S. government to really create a, a dedicated amount of funds for this um, and to coordinate more, I, what I particularly liked about it was recognition that um, there's got to be connectivity with the people on the ground in the embassies and and real attention to this theme of corruption, this this problem of corruption, uh, and encouraging embassy staff and, and anointing embassy staff with a particular responsibility for that. I know one of the problems we in the private sector have sometimes in emerging markets when we go into the embassies is to find the person who's going to deal with a quote corruption issue. And a lot of times 
it's uh, uh, very hard, frankly, to pin down who in fact is gonna hold the, that responsibility and who in fact is the real point of contact. It can get pretty messy. I think this is gonna help focus that. It'll help give the private sector to the extent that we have to contend with these issues, uh, a better sense of uh, direction a dire and certainly a sense of commitment. Um, it's not gonna be just about NGOs, which no, no offense intended, but uh, when you're in the private sector and it looks like only the NGOs are the ones who are really doing anything about it or taking action, that can be pretty frustrating and not exactly a good signal. And as Frank, you, you've pointed out, and one of the reasons why I think I'm on this panel is to, to, to confirm that the private sector looks at corruption uh, as a key element in determining whether you're gonna invest and, and whether you're gonna do business in a given country. And the more that there is a really demonstrable impact or effort at least, and then an impact for sure um, on, the ele on the level of corruption in a given country absolutely uh, affects decisions about foreign direct investment. And while I don't wanna get into the geopolitics of the world right now, there is a lot of shifting in supply chains going on right now for a variety of reasons. And a lot of countries that may not have been on the map as a potential contributor in a supply chain now is a potential candidate. So um, I, I think it really behooves a lot of these emerging markets to think very hard and long about how they can go about tackling corruption in their markets in order to demonstrate to private sector that they can be a good venue for at least part of that private, that relevant company's uh, supply chain plans. And Rick, that's, that's a super point because those shifting supply chains represent a set of incentives that could be extraordinarily powerful when trying to motivate governments to put in place anti-corruption reform. And one of the programs at site called Constructive Capital seeks to leverage that in a systematic way. Um, the clock is ticking, so I wanna make sure I get to, uh, to Delia and Abigail. Delia, very quickly from a global point of view, is this action plan likely to be an effective new means of fighting corruption? No doubt, uh, on condition that it includes transparency and accountability on the funds, both at your level in the US government, but also at the local level. Second condition, it involves uh, people, civil society, local civil society, and of course, this uh, embassy uh, anti-corruption contact point, which I think is very important. But if you don't involve local civil society in the programs, this will not work because the third condition is that you cannot impose these pre-cooked or one fits all models because democracy is different and context is determinant in the fight against corruption, particularly in this time of rebuilding forward better. Very good point, Delia, especially in the context of the pandemic. Abigail, last word to you. Can this be effective? I think it has significant potential for two main reasons. Locally within a particular country, the fund could provide support both to fledgling reformers in government, which we've talked about, but also to outside actors, which Delia just raised. And their, moment, their engagement is definitely needed to sustain momentum. Often we see these mass mobilizations driven by the people, by the grassroots actors, but then the transition happens and it's kind of handed off to elites and progress tends to falter. Um, we saw this in our media, we've seen this in many places where there's a sort of demobilization after a transition. And if this assistance can help sustain the engagement of all different segments of society, from journalists to grassroots leaders, that could actually extend the window a little bit further and increase the odds that reforms can really happen during that time. So I think the flexibility of the fund to be able to support either government or civil society or both is quite promising. Um, and secondly, at the geostrategic level, if countries fail to make the leap into more accountable governance, it's not just the people on the ground who lose out and the American companies, as Rick has said, who lose the potential market to invest in, but the winners are the foreign regimes like Russia and China who are using corruption to worm their way into the policymaking process of these vulnerable states. And they thrive on corruption because that increases the odds that they can buy off politicians or buy off procurement deals. And so if the US can help these countries at the pivotal moments, gain a foothold in clean governance during that brief window, 
it can be important not just for the governance outcomes, but also for sovereignty and democratic integrity for years to come. So, so riffing off of your answer, Abigail, when you're you, you're, you're talking about the importance that, that companies can gain a foothold, right? And they and that means that they have to see the risk profile, the risks in a given country, reduced to the point where it's it's worth a gamble to move in. And so I I turn to you, Rick, to ask based on your years of experience, um, both in, in the, the banking world and elsewhere, and now, especially with your position um, with OECD, very quickly, because I see the, the, the senator on my monitor, um, right. what, are, what are two or three things that business looks for? We, we right off the bat look for corruption questions and look at the World Bank doing business index. We look at uh, the stability of the government itself. It's where it's where it's leaning, where it's going. For example, you look at Turkey and the risk premiums gone way up uh, for a variety of reasons that have a lot to do with the leadership there. Um, you know, and after that, it depends on what business you're in as to the, the various factors you look at. But, you know, I think, Frank, for purposes of today, I'm simply going to say corruption's way up there on the scale. And um, I will cede the rest of my time to the senator from uh, Maryland. Rick, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Rick Johnston from City, Delia Ferrer-Rubio from Transparency International, Abigail Bellows from Carnegie. Thank you so much for giving us really valuable context. Andrew? Yeah, thank you, Frank. And, and thank you to the panelists for, for that enlightening discussion. If I was to sum it up very quickly, I would say what we've learned is that, that in developing these programs, uh, speed, responsiveness, uh, an approach that's adaptable, but also coordinated among, well coordinated amongst uh, an interagency process, the most important results oriented uh, is going to be the, the secret to success in all of this. Now, now it's my great privilege to welcome the lead senator sponsor, lead Senate sponsor of the Crook Act, Senator Ben Cardin, a Democrat who is the senior senator for Maryland, my home state right now. And I think it's fair to say the most consistent and productive supporter of anti-corruption legislation on the Hill. That support and leadership for anti-corruption legislation is on display now more than ever before, and it goes beyond the Crook Act. Just this afternoon, two other bills sponsored by Senator Cardin are being considered by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on which the Senator sits. One of these bills is the Combating Global Corruption Act, and the other is the reauthorization of the Global Magnitsky Act, I think a piece of legislation that has had huge impact uh, for the anti-corruption movement. You know, Senator Cardin is also a long and active tenure on the Helsinki Commission on which he is uh, chairman and we've had a great working relationship with Helsinki on these issues in the past as, they, as well. We'll hear from Senator Cardin for a few minutes and then I'll rejoin you in a conversation with the Senator. You know, Senator, it's been a very rainy day here in Washington and it's my pleasure to hand you the floor for your views on sunshine and transparency. Well, Andrew, thank you for that very generous introduction. I must confess, I got to my office very early this morning, uh, so I didn't notice how the weather has been outside and it's been a very busy day. So, but let me give you an update first on what you just said it was consider to pass. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee has recommended favorably to the full Senate, the uh, combating global corruption and the reauthorization of Magnitsky, uh, global Magnitsky. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that before getting to the Crook Act. But, but first, I really want to thank the Center for International Private Enterprise, uh, the National Endowment, the Chamber, for your support of, of this uh, topic. It couldn't be more timely, couldn't be more important. President Biden made a declaration that I am not surprised, uh, but it's good to see the President of the United States stated very publicly that corruption is a core US national security interest. I was uh, at a national security meeting uh, during the Obama administration where that became very clear that corruption affects our national security. Again, I'm not surprised as, as Andrew pointed out, I chaired the US Helsinki Commission, our implementing arm to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which has three baskets, one on good governance, human rights, one on economics and environment, and one on uh, security type military issues. And the theme of Helsinki has proven that if you don't have good governance, you don't have security. 
If you don't have good governance, you're not going to have economic prosperity. They are, they, they are absolutely interwoven. Uh, I issued a report from the Senate Foreign Re Relations Committee Dems in 2018 about President Putin of Russia's asymmetric arsenal to bring down democratic states. And one of those tools is corruption, including exporting corruption. Now, corruption is the provides the, the fuel, the kleptocrats provide the means in which Mr. Putin can conduct his activities. He depends upon corruption. Authoritarian regimes need corruption in order to survive. And now they're exporting it as part of their strategy to bring down democratic states. So the Senate, uh, the uh, Helsinki Commission just recently sponsored a caucus against foreign corruption and hypocrisy. Uh, there is more focus on this issue now than ever before, and that is great. And your uh, program today is really putting a spotlight on this. The two bills I refer to before I get to the Crook Act, I'm very proud of the Combating Global Corruption that passed unanimously in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee today. It sets up a tier rating on how well countries are doing in dealing with anti-corruption measures. It's patterned after the trafficking in persons law and reports uh, with tier ratings. And those countries that are not making progress to an acceptable level, tier three, there would be consequences to those actions. In addition, uh, we require that every mission, every mission that we have in a foreign country have a focal point person to deal with anti-corruption. So our strategy is pretty simple. We wanna be more resilient at home in our system to fight corruption. We want to target kleptocrats with sanctions, and we want to work with our allies to build rule of law abroad. And that's where the Crook Act comes in. And I'm very proud that Senator Wicker, my co-sponsor of the Crook Act, the two of us, Democrat, Republican, this is not a partisan issue. And, and what it does very simply is take funds from the Anti-Corruption Action Fund. Uh, it sets up an a anti-corruption uh, action Fund takes money from the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, by imposing a uh, five million surcharge dollar surcharge on any award over fifty million dollars of criminal fines or penalties. So it allows those that are guilty of participating in corruption to take some of those revenues to fight corrupt systems. And it's it's not unique. We do we do that today uh, for uh, human trafficking and child pornography in other areas where we take money from uh, the perpetrators and help the victims. So this is an effort to build resiliency. Now, I just caught the tail end of your, uh, of your, uh, of your panel, and I love the way it was, it was uh, summarized. Uh, our current efforts to fight corruption is minuscule. We, we have some permanent programs in the tune of a little over $100 million to, to fight corruption, but these are multi-year technical programs. They're not programs aimed at dealing with opportunity that presents itself to help establish anti-corruption regimes. And they're unable to respond in a nimble way to opportunities that are available. And I can cite you many examples. The, the example that probably is, is, is the most relevant that I think people can understand is that in 2014, we had the revolution of dignity in Ukraine. There was such a, I was there, I was at, in the mind of, with the people demonstrating the, the fact that they wanted an honest government. We should have been able to respond to that opportunity more aggressively to establish the structure within Ukraine for fighting corruption. Because you see, Ukraine had a long history of corruption. Not unusual, a lot of countries do. It was an opportunity when the people were able to throw off the chains we had an opportunity to really make much stronger progress than we did. And, and I can mention the Velvet Revolution in Armenia or the recent the 2018 elections in Malaysia. These present unique opportunities and we have to be nimble in the way that we can respond and consequential in the way that we can respond. And the Crook Act gives us that capacity. So that's why I was so excited uh, to be here. I know that you are working to advance our efforts to fight corruption. We've got to do this together. Uh, the other point that you made, coordination, absolutely essential. 
well targeted. Absolutely, we need competency. We need the information. And, and I think the Crook Act, coupled with the ability to sanction under Magnitsky, coupled with understanding uh, where we are with the uh, Global uh, Corruption Act, give us the tools where we can really make progress in fighting corruption internationally and improving our own system here at home. Well, thank you, Senator, and I and I, I thank you for that sort of holistic strategy that you're putting together to to, to fight corruption. You know, I, I look back on Ukraine and and Syke was active in Ukraine. I was actually uh, key to our our programs there at the time when the Maidan happened. And I, I sh we share your vision on this because you know we were we were there working with the private sector on the ground, uh, and there was a huge opening, and uh, there there was a, a great opportunity there. Uh, that I think we, we, we missed to a certain extent because of, of the traditional uh, responses um, that we put together. And that was sort of the impetus for us to start thinking along the lines of how can we mobilize our stakeholders in the private sector and in the civil society to, to react more quickly. But it certainly does need to be a more coordinated effort with government, with, with, uh, with other organizations. And I also appreciate your views on sort of the nature of the, the the challenge we have from authoritarian states and how corruption uh, is, a, is a key uh, tool for their uh, expansion of influence around the world. Uh, we're, we're titling this corrosive capital at site. Uh, we look at the effect that, that investment has in, in, in especially uh, countries where the rule of law is weak. Uh, and A, they use the openings of weak rule of law to get into a country, but then like water flowing through cracks in a system, they then expand those cracks uh, through their own corruption uh, and, and exploiting uh, corrupt elites to, to make these, these sorts of investments profitable and often against the interests of the local population when they do happen. Uh, but as, as Rick mentioned earlier in our conversation, the, the, the analogous to that also is, uh, is, is, con, is um, constructive capital. Uh, and we certainly, that's what we really want to encourage is the flow of, of constructive capital that reinforces rule of law in these countries moving forward. I'd like just to, to probe you a little bit further on this idea of coordination, though, because uh, we, we know also in terms of, of, um, of, of, let, of, of efforts on anti-corruption, this is often uh, something that has to be done within and, and between international donors uh, in, an, in, in an environment. The U.S. just can't be the only voice uh, in a local uh, uh, setting to promote this. How do you foresee the Crook Act being able to, to encourage uh, the U.S. and other international donors to coordinate efforts uh, on these on these issues. Andrew, it's a very important question, and there, first of all, in the the Crook Act itself, it allows the partnerships to be governmental or non-governmental. So we can work with other governments. We can work with civil societies. We can work with other advocacy groups that are working within country. But the key here is not only being able to form those type of coordinated efforts and to leverage, you know, you leverage uh, the participation of the Crook Fund uh, uh, resources to leverage more resources by having it available with opportune dollars that are available through other parties, including the private sector. All of that can be coordinated under the Crook Act, but it also avoids the bureaucracy of what we have in established programs. If you're trying to comply with the established budgetary funds that are made available uh, and trying to go through the bureaucracies involved there, it is so much more difficult to be have a coordinated effort. Uh, so it, it's, it's the fact that this is set up to be nimble and you can act quickly and you don't have to go through the normal bureaucratic um, check boxes on a on a multi-year program to make sure you're covering what the program was established for. Here, you can be nimble to deal with the, the uh, availability. You can be think out of the box on your partners. You don't have to go through uh, established partners that may not be effective in trying to put it together. You can be very local and you can be used private. It really gives you all those flexibilities and you can be tough and leverage it with dollars from the private sector. So you can, you can do all of that uh, with the Crook Fund. So, I think it gives us a much better chance to, to respond to a circumstance such as Ukraine. Well, being a private sector organization as we are, uh, I'd like to, to just um, get your thoughts a little bit more, maybe have you think outside of the box a little bit about ways to engage the private sector. Now, you've talked about leveraging funds. 
Are there other mechanisms in terms of their, their leadership, whether uh, the, the uh, multinational private sector or the local private sector for that matter? Uh, uh, your, your thoughts on how the private sector might be effectively engaged through the mechanisms that the Crook Act provides us? Well, we need a real buy-in by the private sector because, you know, quite frankly, American companies are required uh, to comply with basic uh, anti-bribery and anti-corruption rules. That's under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. They're required to do that. But that's not the general rule in so many countries. So the private sector is fueling the corruption of the system. And unless we have their help and cooperation, it's difficult to break that uh, cycle. So a part of this is an effort to say to the private sector, you're gonna do much better with a country that has rule of law, where you don't have to worry about the rules changing on you based upon corruption and the needs of corrupt leaders. So we absolutely have to have the buy-in from the private sector if we're gonna be effective in taking advantage of opportunities to establish anti-corruption regimes. So that's, that's embedded in the Crook Act as one of the, the, the bedrocks. Uh, and you know, I, I would tell you, I've been in this for a while and I'm amazed at how many countries uh, do crazy things like have set-asides for US companies that don't have to pay bribes versus other countries. That's crazy. And you know, it, businesses don't want to operate that way to decide whether they fall under a quota where they don't have to pay a bribe. So we need their help in saying, no, they're not going to participate. Uh, have their, we have their support. And more importantly, the people of the country are supporting their activities. Well, that, that, that brings me to, to probably the logical follow on question on that. And that's the, the question of political will in countries. And I think that, you know, those of us who've been working on anti-corruption uh, programs for many years, you know, we can mobilize civil society, we can get people angry, we can bring the private sector to the table, but quite often where these strategies fall down is the lack of political will. Uh, and, you know, it, I think the, the, the question out there is, you know, what can we do as, a, as, as an, an American government uh, as, uh, to, to reinforce uh, these local efforts, these, these other efforts, or even the efforts that the embassies may be undertaking themselves, I guess, through, through the Crook Act, what can, what can we do to leverage our position uh, to, to encourage greater political support domestically in country uh, when, when we're looking to, 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 to fight corruption? Well, it starts with political leadership, and, it was, and it's good to see uh, the Biden administration at every level emphasizing the importance of fighting corruption. Uh, I have met with leaders of other countries uh, during the last couple of months, and anti-corruption has come up because President Biden has mentioned it. I've talked to cabinet level, uh, not just Secretary of State, but in other agencies where corruption has come up. So it's leadership and making it clear that this is a focal point. Why? Because we do not believe you can have stable regimes. You cannot have democratic regimes unless you have a uh, commitment to fight corruption. So we make that clear at, at that level. Secondly, we're gonna help you do it. We're gonna help you do it because our mission in, state, in country will have capacity to let you know where you are out of compliance with international standards, where you need to deal with an independent judiciary or anti-bribery laws or uh, deal with uh, financing uh, the prosecutors or uh, all of the above. Uh, so we, we help you in our mission because we now, assuming we can pass this, this uh, 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 anti-corruption bill that passed uh, this, this finance committee today, the Global uh, Combating Corruption Act, uh, we'll have capacity in mission to not just evaluate, but also to help countries deal with anti-corruption agenda. So well, we don't want to lecture. We just want to be technical and help. But we also want to point out that if you're not making progress, if you're not getting up to minimum standards, there's going to be consequences. And uh, it's very nice for our diplomats to say, gee, we'd like to help you out. But we can't because Congress has passed this law that says that we have to do this rating. And uh, it, to me, I compare it again to the trafficking in persons. If you're on tier three and trafficking in persons, nothing we can do to help you. You got you to help yourself first. This is modern day slavery. 
And if you're not doing the basic minimums, and the minimums are not all that dramatic, you know, like don't take bribes uh, and have a, a system that we have to take action against you. So we, we make this a priority by our language. We make this a priority by where we put our resources and we make it our priority for consequences if they don't meet minimum standards. The other, of course, question that, that, that comes up, and we were talking a little bit about it in, in, with our expert panel before you joined us, is uh, the question of, of coordination uh, in, within our own government agencies, uh, which all have various roles to play within anti-corruption uh, efforts, uh, different strengths that they can bring to the table. Uh, but it's always been a little elusive, I think, uh, for those of us who've been on the ground to see how all of these pieces can fit together in an effective strategy. Uh, how do you foresee uh, the Crook Act promoting uh, better coordination between our own government agencies uh, in, in fighting corruption and, and um, how do we measure their success in doing so? That's an excellent point. And uh, we do want a coordination. And I think the Crook Act, because there's resources there, uh, will uh, by necessity require uh, our different agencies to work in unity, but more importantly, it also puts the interest, I hope in National Security Council and the White House, that they also are gonna demand interagency strategies and then use the Crook Act as a vehicle to implement that strategy. So that it's, it's not just the Crook Act, it's language on coordination, it's the fact it's a tool that works through coordination and is directed through literally the, the White House, through, through the the top of leadership in our country. I think that's how you really can utilize this. Today, that's not possible because the White House doesn't have the resources to spend. They have to go to the different agencies. Yeah, you get through the different agencies, but it's not that easy. You have a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy is there for a reason. In this case, we, we want to be able to be able to have that coordinated effort by multi-agencies directed from the top with the financing independent of the formula funding or the structural funding that's available for multi-year programs. Would you see, where do you, where would you see this leadership sitting? Would it sit in a particular agency or would there be a coordinating body uh, within the White House on these issues? Where do you think that approach would be most effective? I think it really does come down through the National Security Council. I think uh, President Biden is correct. This is a core national security concern. So I really do think that the opportunities of where we can move rapidly and do progress, that it would be the National Security Council having information from the intelligence community as to what is happening in country. It would be the State Department telling us the capacity we have in that country and the partners that are available in order to deal with this. It is our diplomats in, in country that get the message directly out and can act as a bridge to how these resources can really be used to make a consequential difference. So I, I really think it's that type of a coordinated effort uh, that works best. So I, I would say, and we, we didn't talk about the intelligence community, but they're gonna be absolutely essential in, in this working. We, we gotta have a, a country where this is possible. Uh, you know, when you get these really transformational changes that we've seen in some countries, that will die down in a matter of months if you don't take advantage of it. So the intelligence community can help us as to who the players are and who we have to meet with. I think one of the, the more intriguing aspects of, of the Crook Act as well is, is the issues of transparency in business, as well as the, the, the global flow of, of funds uh, that, that, that helps prop up authoritarian uh, and corrupt individuals, um, you know, where they safe harbor their funds. Can you talk a little bit about what the Crook Act does to, to put a little bit more onus on the private sector uh, to play its role in combating corruption? Well, first of all, if, if a company is, is violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and transparency is required under that act, uh, there are severe penalties. So uh, it is really putting some benefit to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to help make the circumstances better in a country so we don't have to have the temptations and challenges that businesses have in working in corrupt regimes. So it, it really works very closely with that. Transparency is absolutely essential. If you don't have, it's one of the fundamental issues of anti-corruption is transparency. 
you have to have transparency. And we have that transparency in the way that we use the crook funds. No question about that. This is not a secret agenda. This is an agenda uh, that supports the populist uh, uh, demand for change in countries, works with civil societies, uh, works with uh, the uh, uh, business community, uh, because if, if you can get civil society and business community together to say, we want rule of law, we want to have a system that's fair, fair for our entrepreneurs, fair for our people, where the wealth of the country can be shared by the people of the country. I think all that uh, can only happen in sunlight. It can only happen with transparency. I maybe just probe you a little bit more on this angle too, because we've talked about coordination between government agencies. We've talked about coordination with other donors. We've talked about putting the pressure on uh, the, the, the local institutions and the local political leadership. Coming from our organization where we've, we've worked very hard on these issues for many years, because frankly, our, our partners around the world have been telling us it's been an issue. Our partners being the, the business associations and the private sector abroad, as well as, as the policy groups abroad. What can we bring to the table uh, in this equation? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's, a, there's an appetite uh, amongst the civil society. There's an appetite on, amongst the private sector. There's an awareness that I think we're at an inflection point uh, in the global economy uh, between, uh, the, if you will, the corrosive and the constructive elements or visions for, for economic growth. What can we bring to the table and what do you expect of us uh, moving forward uh, to, to help make the Crook Act uh, uh, an effective right. piece of legislation alongside all the other efforts you're putting in place. What do you want from us? Well, first, a country's economic success depends upon entrepreneurships and business opportunity. So we welcome opportunities for business expansion in countries and opportunities in countries. What we don't want to see is kleptocrats and kleptocracy. We, we don't want to see where the wealth of the country is funneled up through corrupt bosses that pay off the political leaders of the country and continue to fuel a system that not only doesn't give a legitimate business a fair shake, it doesn't give the people a fair shake. They're not getting what, what, what they need. So if the business community can stop the funneling, there won't be kleptocrats. And if we can end kleptocrats, we've broken the chain. And maybe, just maybe, we could put this fund out of business if we can get rid of the, the kleptocrats. So I, I think we really, but we can't get rid of the kleptocrats unless the business community is on our side. And, and the business community recognizes that they're going to thrive under rule of law. They really don't want to get swept up to see their IT stolen, their funds stolen. And the only way they can protect their safety is by participating in corruption. Uh, as we're, we're getting down to our, our close here, I, I do want to uh, recognize you uh, as sort of one of the leading and consistent lights on the Hill uh, in regard to uh, anti-corruption, but also the tremendous support you've provided over the years for uh, democracy support programs. I think we, we really do want to salute you for that and thank you for your, your enduring support for, for the work of SITE, the Ned family, and, and our, our sister institutes. But I, I, I want to sort of be, maybe be a little cheeky here and say, well, how do you know when your work is done? Uh, what, what is your measure of success? We've talked about the need for metrics on, on, on fighting corruption and, and, and to doing that. But how do you know when your work is done? Uh, what will be your measure of success when you can say we've, we've done what we need to do here and let's, let's focus our attention elsewhere? Well, I think we can make major progress and we can modify programs because of the progress that we've made. I mean, I look forward to the day where we don't need the Magnitsky sanctions because we don't have countries that don't penalize the, pe their, the people in their country that are committing human rights violations. I look forward to that day, uh, but I'm not naive. And I think we are gonna always need to keep a spotlight on this. Human nature being the way it is, uh, empower, being a corruptive force to even some of the strongest governments, we're gonna always need a watchdog on honesty. So uh, I really do think we are gonna always have challenges. 
Um, and yes, we can judge the progress that we've made. We can judge that in so many different ways. Uh, you know, we, we, human, we have a lot of different organizations that tell us how free a state is. One thing is, if a state does not have the, 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 the framework for the minimum standards, we know that country is not going to have basic democratic principles. So I think we can, there, there are things we can use to judge how well a country is doing. Uh, and that's why the rating system on any corruption is pretty objective. It's not, we're not being subjective to a country because we don't like their leader or we don't like something about them. It's, it, these are objective standards. Do you have anti-bribery laws? Do you enforce them, independent judiciary? So when will we be finished? I don't know if we'll ever be finished, but I can, I can tell you when we can take a deep breath when kleptocracies are a thing of the past where we are really fighting uh, individual uh, indiscretions that are occurring, which we always have. There's always going to be weakness of individuals. We'll always fight that. But when we don't have the, the systemic corruption within a country, then I think we can take a, a breath and we can look at modifying some of our tools. Well, Senator, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank you. We're at the end of our session here, but I, I do think we, we've... Uh, had a fairly optimistic session today, even though we've, we've got a great uh, a challenge in front of us. And that's uh, due in large part to the toolkit that you're providing uh, those of us in civil society and in the private sector, as well as our colleagues in government to, to take on this huge challenge. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to know that we've got the support, the bipartisan support uh, for the programs that you're putting forth on the Hill. Uh, and I can tell you and promise you uh, uh, from our perspective that you'll have our support uh, in when these things come to implementation uh, and when the hard work needs to be done on the ground. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing how this act, uh, as well as the Magnitsky Act and the, the, the new corruption legislation that you're putting in place, can, can really put together a comprehensive approach to anti-corruption. And I, I, we just want to thank you for your time in, in sharing uh, information on these programs with us. Uh, and we look forward to, to uh, working with, with our colleagues on this call from civil society, from the private sector and elsewhere on making these things a reality. Thank you, Senator. Uh, well, and we wish you the best. Well, again, thanks for uh, putting on this uh, program. It's critically important. I look forward to continuing to work for you. And thank you for the nice comments that you put in. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Stay Senator. Well. Thank you, Senator. And, and thank you to all our viewers. Uh, goodbye.